And we're back, um, and we're going to hear from Dr. Diana Kenny. Uh, Diana is a former professor of psychology and professor of music at the University of Sydney, and now she's a consulting psychologist, psychotherapist, uh, mediator, family dispute resolution practitioner, an expert reviewer, report writer, supervisor, researcher, and author. Um, Diane's an experienced psychologist and psychoanalyst who works in Sydney, Australia. And Diana, we're delighted to welcome you to talk about the psychological underpinnings of institutional capture. Um, I think you're going to talk to us about group think and how we get there. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is a picture of a very famous painting by the artist René Magritte. What is the paradox of this art that he titles La Trahison des Images, which means the treachery of images? With the words, ceci n'est pas une pipe, this is not a pipe, the viewer is presented with an irreconcilable contradiction that ultimately renders language problematic because it clearly is a pipe, though it is actually not a pipe, but a signifier or representation of the pipe. Does ceci, the French word for this, refer to the drawing or to the statement, the text or the image? The image is not a pipe. There is no pipe. The exteriority of written and figurative elements are symbolised by non-relations between the painting and the title. So what has this got to do with the topic at hand, which fundamentally is about gender ideology? Well, by analogy, we may ask the question, are trans women women? How do we know? These images above are like Magritte's pipe, but by degrees are removed from their physical representation. There is the superficial appearance of femaleness, but we are not actually seeing women on this slide or even representational images of women. They are optical illusions. The disjunction between the text and the figurative has been distorted and uh, distorted to mislead. So why is this so? Because sex is an objective biological dimorphic trait whose purpose is the procreation of the species. A person with double X chromosomes is female a person with XY chromosomes is male. Males deliver sperm produced by testes and females provide the receptive ovum um, produced by the ovaries for fertilization. Males can never provide ova and females can never provide sperm. Gender affirming treatment cannot alter this unassailable fact of human biology even when men have their organs amputated and they have electrolysis, facial reconstruction, wear wigs, makeup, and stereotypically or exaggerated feminine clothing. A woman is an adult female human with breasts, a uterus, and ovaries. These images do not meet the definition applied to 99.9% .9 of all animal species. But images do not require internal organs or to show external organs camouflaged by female clothing. Even if these individuals had undergone vaginoplasty, their neo-vaginas are not vaginas. Unlike Magritte's pipe, in which the exteriority of written and figurative elements are symbolised by non-relations between the painting and its title, the images of these trans women blur these non-relations through the use of deception and illusion. So our ultimate conclusion must be, ceci n'est pas une femme, these people are not women. So what is a woman? Okay, the connection to my video clip, 
um, is not going to come through. Okay. We'll end with this because we're talking about oh. womanhood. So people could probably shout out the question I'm going to ask you right now. Okay. You know that you're a woman. Yes. What is that? Uh, so gender is a social thing. It only makes sense. I don't want to hear that. What is a woman? What no. is a woman? What is a woman? The word, word woman, define in the dictionary, go. A woman is somebody who is included and respected and seen and participates in society, recognized by other women. If you speak with women... Circular definition. That's mine, whatever. Okay, all right. Well, well and... Okay, so it appears like uh, members of the trans female community can't define themselves. So let's have a look at this slide. Um, and apply the same analysis to the iconography of gender ideology. The fundamental tenet of this dogma is that sex and gender exist beyond the binary, and yet we cannot see or define the beyondness to which this concept purportedly refers. What is non-binary? We have never seen a definition. One cannot define a construct by a double negative. That is, non-binary is neither female nor male. The nexus between the image of the pipe and its actual objective realisation is far easier to understand than the relation between a rainbow-coloured flag and the text used by the transgender industry to sell its wares, demi-boys, demi-girls, pansexuals, omnisexuals, two-spirit, Womax, Zizer. What does the representational image, this multicoloured flag, convey about the object portrayed? Indeed, what is the object? This is the world's most recognised flag until the rainbow, but it certainly conveyed a great deal. So this is a prelude to my trying to understand what are the psychological underpinnings of institutional capture. And I thought this quote was apt. Absurdity is the new sublime. The good news is that while other resources are dwindling, absurdity is multiplying and flourishing and filling the earth. So gender ideology is the belief that the peak institutional bodies have adopted. How can such an absurdity occur? What are the dark forces operating in our professional bodies that have permitted such a collective delusion? I do not have the complete answer. However, I will attempt to argue a case from principles drawn from other spheres of the social sciences, social psychology, sociology, and psychoanalysis. So I've put together a, a list of possibilities as to what the factors that may help us under, uh, understand institutional capture. These are the concepts of social contagion, groupthink, cultural appropriation, conformity, complicity, collaboration, cults, and political correctness and wokeness. The most compelling yet least discussed causative factor in institutional capture is social contagion. The same social forces that are influencing our young people are also affecting the bedrock social institutions that underpin our society. These in turn have affected parents, teachers, doctors, lawyers, politicians and sporting officials. I have yet to speak with any adherents who really understand gender ideology. 
the influence of this potent human behavioural phenomenon was understood by Carl Jung, however, who stated, it is not famine, not earthquakes, not microbes, not cancer, but man himself, who is man's greatest danger to man, for the simple reason that there is no adequate protection against psychic ep epidemics, which are infinitely more devastating than the worst of natural consequences. So, Charles Mackay actually wrote a book called The Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds um, in 1841. And you'll notice that this date vastly precedes the digital age. So it's not the digital age that is completely to blame for the capture of the universe by gender ideology. It has just um, facilitated and amplified what is going on in the psyches of human beings. In the second edition to his book in 1852, he said that men think in herds, they go mad in herds while they only recover their senses slowly, one by one. And that's the sad thing for us um, who are trying to um, counteract this, this movement that uh, we have to convince individuals in high places to change their minds. So what is social contagion and how does it work? Social network analysis, the method applied to study contagions of all kinds, was first developed and used in public health as a way of determining the spread of diseases like influenza, HIV, AIDS and more recently COVID that resulted in physical pandemics. It was subsequently applied to the challenges of introducing changes and innovations in the health system. Its applications have since expanded with the advent of computers, the internet, mobile and smartphones, and social media. Members of a network play different roles in the dissemination of so-called innovations. A small number will adopt early some of these will become opinion leaders who are central to the network, who contaminate their peers, who in turn will influence those others at different levels of the network. There are three types of social networks, egocentric or networks assessing a single individual, sociocentric, which are social networks in a well-defined social space, such as schools or hospitals, and open system networks such as globalised markets and social media. Each network consists of nodes or members and ties which are links between nodes and measures of centrality, density and periphery or distance between the nodes. Networks with high centrality are the most effective in disseminating information or innovation. A key example with respect to this discussion is the transactivist lobby that has achieved spectacular success in a short time in changing healthcare, educational practices and legislation related to self-declared transgender individuals. Other characteristics of networks include cohesion, that is the number of connections within a network and shape that is the distribution of ties within the network. So how do these networks work? Well, primarily through surveillance and punishment. We have fallen into a bizarre form of Stockholm syndrome, where we captives now sympathize, aid and abet our captors. In the 20s and 30s, um, it may seem a glib comparison, but the rise of the Third Reich in Germany is a compelling example of the utilisation of networks of social influence that created an almost unanimous subscription of the German people to Nazi ideology. Hitler used the word Gleichschaltung, meaning the same circuit, denoting the concept of coordination, 
that cemented the new principles of Nazism in every social institution in the country, across economics, trade, media, culture, law and education, to eliminate all forms of opposition, both in thought and deed, to the new regime. Like the Nazi Party and its ideologists, gender ideologists have created a vocabulary to capture their warped and delusional view of sex and gender, and methods like those used by Nazi Germany to ensure the ideological capture of all sources of influence within multiple social networks. Threat of sanctions, including fear of job loss and public vilification, were and are used by both gender ideology regimes and the Nazi regime to silence dissent. Hitler knew the value of capturing his acolytes early through education and indoctrination. Parents had no choice about enrolling their children in Nazi schools where they graduated into the Nazi youth and some of them eventually into the Nazi-led armies and the Gestapo. I, can, I, I hope these um, comparisons are very compelling because we can see that education curriculum are corrupting very young children um, through transition ceremonies, uh, pride and rainbow flag days, total acceptance of uh, names and pronouns um, without informing parents and so on. Hitler knew the value of um, capturing these young people and so do the gender ideologists. Um, here we have young people, the early adolescents like our young adolescents who are declaring themselves transgender wrapped around their own rainbow flag. But in this case, it was the swastika. When the Nazis came to power in 1933, membership of the Hitler Youth reached 2.3 million members. By 1940, there were 8 million members of the Hitler Jugend, the Hitler Youth. And they, like the gender ideologists, revel in rallies and symbology. This is just one graph showing the extremely steep increases um, of young people seeking treatment at the former JITS clinic in the United Kingdom in the blue uh, uh, line on the graph and a parallel increase in what was happening in Australia in the same decade. Notice these are absolute numbers but the actual slope of the curves of increase are very similar. And uh, the absolute numbers obviously will be lower for Australia because our population is um, less than one third of Great Britain. But the um, uh, sharpness in rise is parallel. The other mechanisms of institutional capture are collaboration and complicity. And um, the, the, uh, the Hit Hitlerian ideology um, forced collaboration and compl on complicity through scapegoating to create in-groups and out-groups. One of the best ways of ensuring collaboration is the indoctrination of children. Plato knew this very well, as did Vladimir Lenin, who said, give me four years to teach the children and the seed I have sown will never be uprooted. And hundreds of years before Lenin, Plato said, do you not know then that the beginning in every task is the chief thing? especially for any creature that is young and tender. 
for it is then that it is best um, moulded and takes the impression that one wishes to stamp upon it. Another clever way of capturing um, uh, in institutional capture by the gender ideologists is what we call cultural appropriation. Now, if you uh, read the title of this book, the, it was the night before, and of course, we're all saying under our breaths, Christmas, thereby embedding pride and its symbol, the rainbow flag, into the religious imagination of Christian societies, thereby, by association, rendering its precepts as valid, in inverted commas, as Christian precepts. Indeed, it is an old trick, one at which the Christian church itself was adept. In an attempt to draw the populace away from pagan practices and rituals, the Christian church appropriated the pagan rituals into Christian practices. For example, the period of Lent culminating in Easter was originally a pagan celebration of the renewal of life in spring. The church appropriated this celebration to signify Christ's resurrection from the dead. Christianity turned the nature deities, there were you know, gods of stone and trees and flowers, into devils, spells into magic, and spay wives into witches, of whom thousands were burnt at the stake during the Inquisition in the Middle Ages. The church morphed exorcism into benedictions and charms into prayers. And these are the strategies that the gender ideologists are using on our young people today. Another form of cultural appropriation, um, again, utilised very effective by Germany, is the um, appearance of a legitimate, benign and respected organisation. For example, the Boy Scouts, which were banned during the Third Reich, but the Hitler Youth Organisation used the exact format and activities of the Boy Scouts movement to advance their own Nazi ideology. Another feature of institutional capture is what is known as groupthink. Groupthink is a term that was coined by a social psychologist called Irving Janus in 1972. And it's an extreme form of conformity in which people are prepared to keep the peace at all costs. It occurs in homogeneous groups when a powerful and charismatic group leader is insistent on a preferred course of action, when the group is under severe stress, where significant moral dilemmas are part of the decision matrix and where objective outside experts are not called upon. The consequences of groupthink include the illusion of invulnerability, collective rationalisation, stereotyping of outgroups, self-censorship, belief in the inherent morality of the group, poor information search, incomplete survey of alternatives, failure to appraise the risks of the preferred solution, selective information processing, and conflation of ethics with expedience. Political correctness and wokeness are a form of social groupthink that is utterly pervasive of gender ideology and institutional capture. And um, I don't have time to go through multiple, multiple 
um, examples of all of those elements of groupthink that we're seeing in the propagation of gender ideology amongst our young, but also in the very clever ways in which gender ideology has captured our critical institutions. So that leads me to the question, is gender ideology a cult that has infected our institutions? Cultic language is often steeped in familial terms and it's a form of worship or adherence to specific rites and ceremonies in which excessive devotion is paid to a particular person or belief system, creating a closed group environment, everything within which is deemed good and everything outside of which is deemed bad. A cult is an institution similar to a prison or other closed social system networks. It comprises unswerving loyalty to the ideology us and them. And it's a mentality that creates in-groups and out-groups. Recruitment of vulnerable young people whom the cult leaders isolate from family and other social networks, subject them to long periods of indoctrination and reward them with compliance with uh, required sacrifices like double mastectomies. Between two and five million Americans have been involved in cults. Cults sever family and other social ties in order to attach the new member to the cult. For this reason, cultic language is often steeped in familial terms. The cult leader becomes the true father to his cult family. One cult actually called itself the family. Cult members often have their names changed as a further strategy to sever their former ties and to disconnect them from their pre-cult lives. Individuality and independence are forbidden and violations of those wishing to retain their own mind are often severely punished, which is the treatment meted out to desisters, regretters and detransitioners. New members are re-socialised into cultic norms. Cults are a little like human psyches. They divide the world into good, the cult, and evil, the non-cult. Cults also evince other psychopathology, including primitive narcissism and grandiosity. Cult members perceive themselves above or outside social norms, laws or any sanctions imposed from without. Stolarov argues that a resurrective ideology, which are really variations of knowing who you are and being your authentic self, is an attempt to retreat to and retrieve an earlier, less problematic existence before puberty, for example, in gender ideology, before trauma shatters innocence and a naive belief in an ordered and meaningful existence. I will leave you to decide whether the transgender movement is indeed a cult. So, individual and institutional capture, are the processes the same? Individuals start cults and individuals cause their disintegration. The same forces that I have described here affect individuals and organisations in similar ways. Institutions like individuals are subject to social contagion, groupthink and the problems of complicity, conformity, collaboration, cowardice and the abandonment of critical thinking. 
Transgenderism is primarily a socio-cultural and political phenomenon, not a psychological or medical phenomenon that has been fueled by both social contagion and groupthink social processes. You will observe all the features described above in the conduct of transgender advocacy individuals and social institutions alike once they adopt the gender ideology culture. It has all been done before. Flags, symbols, simplified ideology, slogans, new vocabularies, displays of solidarity, indoctrination of children, bullying dissenters into silence with threat of sanctions or getting rid of them altogether. There is absolutely nothing new in the processes underlying the spectacular success of gender ideology. What is the sinister agenda underneath ideological capture of institutions? First of all, it's being part of the in-group. Second, there are major rewards for compliance and major punishments uh, or, or sanctions for dissent. Self-interest is a major governing factor as to why individuals become complicit in immoral conduct. The prospects of promotion, praise, power, and above all, money. Monetary gain is there for all. Big pharma, surgeons, other medical specialists are finding expanding markets increasing their practices and therefore their revenue. There is always the silent majority. Evil triumphs when so-called good people do nothing. Or as Voltaire once said, we are all guilty of the good we do not do. Then there is history. Those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And the human race always fails to learn from history. The sociology of group behaviour. This is a critical factor, that people behave differently in groups compared with how they behave um, as individuals. And that is why um, in techniques of crowd control, when the crowds look as if they're getting out of hand, the security guards and the police go up to individuals in the crowd and say to them, I want your name, your identification and your place of residence. And immediately the behaviour ceases. So people will become disinhibited in crowds, but they resort to civility when they're confronted individually. Not all, but many, and it's a very effective form of crowd control. So Voltaire, again, I turn to. He says, those who are able to make you believe absurdities are able to make you commit atrocities. Where have we gone wrong to believe absurdities and for some of us to commit absurdities and atrocities against our young uh, in this generation of children and adolescents? I want you to imagine this scenario. Divorced warring parents with one child, a biological male currently aged 10 years, Mother unilaterally made the decision to transition him and he was fully socially transitioned at age four. She calls her child by a secret female name that she and the child refused to disclose. Mother tried very hard to withhold the child from contact with his father, but his father was resilient and persistent 
and is able under court orders to spend time with his son, not as much as he would like, but better than not at all. When the boy is with his father, he dresses as a male, uses his birth name and does what society would label more stereotypically masculine activities with his father, such as fishing, bike riding and bushwalking. He never asks his father to dress up, wear female clothing or play with Barbies. He has on a number of occasions surreptitiously told his father that he was a boy. Three weeks ago, I was part of an expert conclave, which is an attempt to gain consensus between opposing experts prior to court proceedings. It included those opposed to medical transition of minors and gender ideology propagators and aficionados. When we demolished every claim the pro-transition team made with evidence they responded, your problem is that you don't believe in transgender children. You either believe in them or you don't, and you don't. That is why we can never reach consensus. Note the language. I had a light bulb moment. Gender ideology really is a religion. I have not been hyperbolizing to call it such. More than that, it is also a cult. I suspected so from the first, but to hear it said in a judicial setting and used as a valid argument for transgendering a 10 year old was staggering, dismaying and sobering. The pro-transitioning acolytes belong to institutionally captured organisations like gender clinics and medical, psychiatric and paediatric professional bodies. How is it that supposedly intelligent, well-educated psychologists, psychiatrists, paediatricians and endocrinologists, teachers and school principals can not only believe but embrace nonsense? That is the subject for another presentation. I will leave you with the quote from Voltaire as my final statement. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Diana. Um, your presentation has sparked quite an exchange on the chat. Um, and we do want to move into a summing up period. And I hope perhaps you can join uh, Jan and me for that. Um, but there is one question that I'd like to invite your response to. Um, there are clearly parallels in terms of institutional capture with what happened uh, under National Socialism in Germany in the 1920s and 30s. Um, but is there a risk in using the Nazi analogy that it locks us into a good, bad or even good evil polarization of exactly the same sort that you talked about in relation to cults. Um, so how can we learn from the past in order not to be condemned to repeat it, um, but without locking in the polarization? Desperate times call for desperate measures. And um, I'm not suggesting that you know, saying people use the Nazi analogy, but what I'm trying to do is help people understand why gender ideology has been so successful um, because they've learned from the past. You know, they would say that um, we've learned our lessons from the past and we can repeat it in a new domain. And we have to be savvy about that. We, it, the time for political correctness and wokeness on our side um, is, is long gone because I've watched hundreds of children destroy their own lives and their families um, through being captured by this cultish ideology. And I'm afraid it's gloves off for me now. Yeah. Well, um, thank you very much. It's been 
a, a question that has just run through my mind through the whole day is how the hell did we get here? And uh, your presentation has shed some light on that, on um, deliberate strategies and tactics and developments around the herd. Um, thank you very much. And I hope you can join us now uh, as Jan comes in for a final summing up of the day. Yeah, oh, good afternoon. Um, I thought I'd, I'd just like to say I am chilled and um, excited by your talk, Diana. And um, I just want to I just want to say my response to it is um, is is more to do with religion and the idea that with religion, um, you know, when you when people stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing. They'll believe in anything and. I kind of see in some ways that our adherence to gender theory is um, in some ways a kind of religion of postmodernism, if you like, a, an individualist religion. And in the way that all religions start, they start with sp spit and fire and, and, you know, and a kind of mandatory quality. Anyway, that's, that's just my uh, th thinking about it. I'm exhausted, but and please, that Genspect Australia New Zealand um, is coming to the end of its first public event. I think it's been a marvellous event and the quality of the speakers couldn't be higher. I want to thank Dr. David Bromell for his excellent chairing and all of the speakers for their contributions. I invite the people who are listening just to reflect on what you've heard over the course of the day um, I'd also like to think, thank all the people who've worked behind the scenes, listening to the speeches and talks being practiced, providing ideas and encouragement. I'm distressed to announce that while we've been listening, while we've been listening to this webinar today, there's been an announcement that Pharmac is going to consult on the, on the provision of testosterone patches for all who need them which is a little bit to me like providing RTDs instead of spirits to kids, an easy access solution that's more palatable than injections. Um, we've had an excellent in introduction to the gender framework, an assessment of the PATHA guidelines as an example of regulatory failure. We've heard Professor uh, Nahuya Te Awaku, Awakutuku on sex and gender, se sexuality and gender in the early Maori world. We've heard Simon Tegg speaking about the high levels of use of puberty blocker medic medication in New Zealand and his reasons for it. We've heard Gillian, Dr. Gillian Spencer comparing the medical systems of Australia and New Zealand and referring to the appalling quality of evidence in our uh, medical pathways. And Sue Middleton and Margaret Kerno talking about sex, gender and identity in schools. Alistair Gunn's incredibly breathtaking discussion with two anonymous parents. And then finally, Diana Kenny's presentation on psychological, psychological underpinnings of institutional capture. Um, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about this and my, I feel as if my mind has been it, broken open with new ideas, insights and fascinating thinking about how we take this forward in New Zealand. And I'd like now to hear some of your ideas, you, you people taking part in this about how you, how you have responded to the event and some of the things that you would like to see against that New Zealand, Australia, New Zealand pick up over the coming months. So uh, please do, do put your uh, comments and feedback in the chat. Uh, there has been one question that came in earlier, Jan, about how people might be able to view the recording of today and the individual parts of it later and whether it's possible to share the links with others who uh, weren't registered for today. Um, do you know what we haven't, um, it, it is possible for all the people who've registered to continue to r r see all of this on delay and in fact a number of people who couldn't make today are going to be doing that over the coming days because obviously you know today being a working day. Um, we are hoping to break the video into small sections and add a lot of them to YouTube. Um, I'd prefer it if people didn't share it publicly for the next little while just in, in order that we 
we that there's that there was a reason for registering. You know, we've we've needed to um, raise money to um, to 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 pay for the technical help that we've had in providing this. But we hope in the in the, in a very short while to um, make a lot of this information available more broadly to the public and to use it as part of our work going into the future. Um, thank you, Jen. There is a comment, it's been a thoughtful day. Thanks for the thinking and cooperation. Uh, we have to make a submission to Farmac. Is that what you're suggesting? <laughs> It, 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 funnily enough, it only invites people already using testosterone, as if there are no other interests in who uses testosterone in our society. I mean, I, I'm not arguing that people should have to have injections rather than patches, but um, it, uh, it's just it's just like we're 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 part of a we're, we're part of a a, a, um, a fast moving train, and you know every day there is there is news. Um. Um. Diana, if I can pass across to you, because we had a, a delayed start, um, we weren't able to have as much of a question time as we had hoped with you. Um, is there anything you'd like to say um, and, and, and contribute to this summing up that you didn't get a chance to say in the uh, tight time frame that you ended up with? Um, look, I could have said I could have said a lot more, but. Um um look it, it's a risky business making parallels with thoroughly discredited organizations and, and ideologies but um it, it's probably not going to um you know persuade the people that we want to persuade but i'm hoping that it will give a framework even if it's a toned down framework to people who are combating you know the um the problems that we're seeing at the moment i mean we're on a rescue mission we're trying to rescue a generation of young people um from you know destroying their futures and their lives um and um i think that's what we have to keep in the forefront um well what and also we have to be um strategic we have to be more savvy we have to be more forceful um, and we have to learn lessons from the gender ideologists themselves. I mean, they've convinced a universe, a whole era of scientifically uh, baseless nonsense upon which they're being bad actors with our young population, with our children and adolescents. And in that, we're um, partly having to deal with our own herd instinct and the difficulty of speaking out and often being the sole voice uh, speaking out against what has become a dominant ideology absolutely yeah yeah I, I realized that for me the thing that made me speak out was absolutely the idea that it was becoming more and more difficult and that as time went by it might become impossible and um, this would be about four or five years ago. And indeed, it was a fundamental change to um, my life to have spoken out. And I went through the experience as a young woman uh, of coming out as a lesbian when I was in my, uh, I think I was 20. And it caused me to have a fundamental change in my friendship group. and my network and my worldview and I'm utterly astounded that the same thing should happen to me 50, 40, 50, almost 50 years yeah. later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, and, I, and I think I didn't deserve to be a heretic, to be a, a, a non, a, an unacceptable person twice. But since it happened the first time, I know how to cope. I know how to cope. I feel like I have this kind of, um, inner resolve that I'm willing to go against the grain. And all of those people who can go against the grain, I want them to have the confidence to develop this kind of inner resolve as well, that this is something worth speaking out for. 
Thank you, Jane. Um, and I, it, it's sad that for some of us, it's it's only once we're retired that we have that freedom to speak against the grain. Um, it's very mm -hmm. difficult for people, particularly who work in professional associations. Um, there is a question that's come up, Jane. Um, is there any possibility of reopening registration still with a charge so people can access all the recordings but still help with the funds um, and be registered <laughs> for the event? Actually, yes, I, I've got, um, I can, oh, without, I, I, what, I can share an, a, a bank account um, information somehow. I, th I think somebody else can find it. I think I've emailed it to a few people who are probably listening. Um, and if and we can certainly share. Um, I can actually after this evening, I can share that information with all the people currently registered, so that if they want other people to access the information, they can make and they don't have to pay the full price. Um, if they make a, a suitable donation, then we will won't refuse anyone who wants to see the information rapidly. And um, I understand that the technology allows us us to do that. Oh, fantastic. Um, It'd be great if you can do that and uh, maybe give some hints about what a suitable donation looks like. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yep, great. Now, um, yep. Jan, is there anything else in terms of summing up the day that uh, you want to achieve? Um, I guess Genspect New Zealand, and uh, Australia and New Zealand, this is our first event. Um, there are a number of projects that we have considered um, that we would like to continue with, and it would be if if anyone if if anyone wants to contact me um, privately or uh, I mean privately by email to Jan at genspec.org, you'd be more than welcome to help us with with this with the kind of ideas and the thinking behind the opposition to gender theory and gender ideology and gender medicine um, in New Zealand. Um, yeah, I just, I, th I think that it's, that, that it's com one of the issues about this area is that it's, it's, it's not trivial to explain what's going on as, as Diana has explained, you know, and, and you have to go to some fairly um, different um, information sets you know, need to know about um, neoliberalism, you need to know about gender theory, um, you need to know about medicine. And it's that makes it quite hard to, as well as the injunctions against us, that makes it quite hard to speak out. So um, I think one of the things that's really helpful is uh, we need some material so that people can learn about this. Um, there's already been a suggestion from one of the participants that we take um, uh, uh, the the presentation from uh, uh, Dr. from Gillian and um, make that available as something that's not a three quarter hour presentation, but something much shorter and more tractable that we can provide to people in the New, New Zealand medical system. And I think that would be an extraordinarily useful um, project with some rebuttals to the quality of of evidence that's contained in there. Um, but uh, yes, I'm open to other ideas that help um, build our, um, our ability to, to carry on. There's one idea that's come through in the chat, uh, whether Genspec Australia New Zealand could help set up collaboration on letter writing campaigns to politicians, um, uh, providing pro forma letters and the like, uh, perhaps you know, along the same sort of way that the Free Speech Union has been so effective uh, here in New Zealand by facilitating that. No, I, th I think that that would be a great idea. I mean, one of the other things that um, hasn't really come up at this event, I don't know whether um, Alistair and Joe talked about it, was more broadly about Genspect and some of the initiatives that it's already undertaking, like Stats for Gender and uh, an organisation called Beyond Transition, which provides low-cost counselling for young people. So there's a whole kind of ecosystem of other organizations around Genspect. Um, there is one project that we want to work on, and that is that uh, several months ago, 
a, an Australian um, KC, I think, of a barrister, uh, Bell Lane, produced a really comprehensive um, assessment of the, 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 it, the, the concerns around gender medicine uh, for an Australian legal audience. And we would really like to do that for a New Zealand audience as well. Um, and just monitoring some of what's coming through, um, a message for Diana, thank you so much for your advocacy on this issue. Uh, you've been a fearless fighter. Um, and a question, Jan, uh, whether Alistair could similarly offer a ticket uh, with a perhaps a streaming price for uh, people to be able to get full access to the replay of the Denver conference. Um, I, I can investigate and I will, I, again, I'll include that in an email to all of the participants about whether that's possible. I, su I suspect it will be. Um, there's been a reminder come in that many schools using school docs are reviewing their health policy this term. So uh, be sure to have your say. Oh, yes. Um, and a reminder, think, yes. Yep. Say oh, some no. more about that, Jan. Oh, well, I'm just aware that there is a private organisation that provides pre-formatted policy for schools. Uh, and unfortunately, that organisation has fully endorsed gender theory. And so what happens with schools is that they automatically get these um, pre-formatted policies around all kinds of things, which include um, which include gender theory too. So it's, it is quite a worry and it's something that parents need to be alert to. Well, that, that would suggest that it's even more important to uh, speak up and have a chat to a principal or chair of the board of trustees. Um, because Indeed. if you're yeah. a busy principal and you're handed with a ready-made policy, um, <laughs> why would you bother <laughs> developing your own? Um, but what they probably need to hear is that there isn't universal community support for the policy as it's been drafted. Absolutely, yes, yep, yes. There's actually currently um, litigation in the United States. Um, parents are banding together against school boards that are propagating gender ideology um, to young people. So they've had carte blanche up until now, but they're um, going to have to think carefully, you know, when monetary loss is is on the agenda and parents are now getting bolder in some of these countries um, and demanding you know um, explanations and trying to reclaim their parental rights um, so I'm, ho I'm hoping that that might come to pass in australia what has happened in australia recently though is that the catholic education department has changed its policy on uh, gender education in schools. And uh, before a child enrolls, they are given the gender policy, which says that there will be no social transition at school and that the child, um, a male child will wear a male school uniform and vice versa. Um, and uh, they, you know, there will be no switching in sports teams or the use of male or female toilets. So I think this is a really big shift in Australia, um, but unfortunately they haven't publicised it. Um, but uh, parents who are very worried about the wokeness that's going on in in public schools need, need to look into that uh, as a possible um, alternative. It's interesting. The, um the Roman Catholic schools probably understand their own history and the old saying of the Jesuits, uh, give me a child until the age of seven, um, which is exactly what you were talking about earlier, Diana. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. There's been a reminder go up too that it is the 50th anniversary of Gay Lib at the University of Auckland. Um, You've no idea how old that makes me feel. Um, so, uh, and, and it, I think it is going to be important for those of us who are gay and lesbian to keep reclaiming uh, the liberation that we fought for all those years ago. 
um, and to do what we can to protect the uh, generation of same-sex attracted children and young people who are being pushed in another direction. Yes, one of the things which um, I was, which sounds like a very, very small thing, but it was, the, I posed the question to Nahuia about um, the, the gifting of the word takatapui. And of course, takatapui is the only word in Māori that allows anyone to speak of their same-sex attraction. And it's always been a source of some irritation to me that that word has been effectively um, it, it, it disemboweled of its meaning by by this claim that it's been that it's been um, gifted, and I was most reassured. I, I thought this would be the case, uh, but that uh, Nahuya said that no, it hadn't been gifted. She said it had been commandeered, and I think that really speaks to the points that Diana has been making, which is that we're we're dealing with a kind of freight train in motion. That, that, that doesn't make fine distinctions and that is quite willing to, um, to, to sort of cut through long established norms in order to make its points. It's a very small thing. But I, when I was speaking to Alistair a few, a few, when we were planning for the conference, he explained to me that there were indigenous Welsh people and that indigenous Welsh people so-called are being weaponized in order to make the case that there's a kind of continuity of indigenous gender identities in Wales and that he thought that that was happening all across the world. Yeah. Look, thank you both. Um, Jane, we're pretty much right on time. Is there anything else you want to say before we close off? No, I'm, that's it's been a wonderful day for me, and I hope that that's been the um, experience for, for many of the participants. Thank you very much. Diana, once again, thank you for joining us. It was a pleasure to, and, to uh, join you. And we will and can, leave it there. Sorry, Diana, you going to say? Oh, yes, I was just going to say to the parents Please think seriously about engaging in class action. Um, there are class action suits going on all around the world at the moment. They do take a while to get off the ground, but it will stop people dead in their tracks and there will be some backpedalling once, um, you know, there's a progression in, um, in, in legal action. Just a thought to leave you with.